Okay, uh, good morning everyone and can I welcome everyone to the 18th meeting of 2019 of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone uh, present to turn off mobile phones or other devices to silent mode as they, we don't want them to, to disturb the meeting. We have to apologise this morning for my Deputy Convener Pauline McNeil who won't be with us uh, and for understandable reasons uh, Michelle Ballantyne will be delayed uh, delayed this morning, unfortunately, so it would be good to see her later on if she's able to, to, to make it. We we move to agenda item one, which is in uh, taking decision to take business in private, and the committee is asked to agree that agenda item four, consideration of evidence heard during uh, this morning's meeting, is taken in private. Is the committee agreed? Okay, thank you. We move to agenda item two, which is universal credit con consent provisions. The committee will take evidence of universal cre credit consent provisions uh, this morning, and can I welcome Richard Gass, Welfare Rights and Money Advice Manager, Glasgow City Council, Sheila McCandy, uh, Benefits and Welfare Manager, Highland Council, Richard Bailey, representing National Association of Welfare Rights Advisors, uh, Nora, is that, is that, I have phrased that right? Uh, yes, uh, uh, acronyms, acronyms and more acronyms. Uh, and we're hoping to be joined by Sandra Stewart uh, a little bit later, advice worker, family advice and information uh, resource. Uh, the acronym being FAIR, that's a nice straightforward one. Uh, thank you for coming along this morning. We we very much appreciate that. We are going to go straight to questions, but I suppose to give some cons uh, uh, context uh, to, to our evidence session this morning, uh, we're minded that the Information Commissioner's Office has given some opinion on how DWP is applying implicit or explicit consent, how that is secured, the length of time that it can endure for before you have to go back and refresh that consent. And it might be helpful to put on record just two snippets of, of that, that advice. In, in April, the Information Commissioner uh, issued the opinion that the, w, the DWP appears to be taking a duly restrictive view of the definition of consent under data protection. Uh, and they also wrote to the DWP asking it to revise its consent policies and internal guidance and to take advice steps to ensure the policy works on a practical level. Now, anyone listening to that, that, these are just abstract things, I suppose, for people listening to this evidence session. But we are told examples of, of the impact of where the DWP are just now um, are, are quite significant and varied. I've got a briefing paper here outlining those, but there's no point in me outlining those issues when we've got witnesses here to, to tell us a little bit about that. So uh, as a more general opening question, we're aware of the change of approach DWP are taking uh, to empowering uh, advocates and welfare rights officers, MPs, MSPs, whoever, to help particularly vulnerable people get, get access to benefits and advice that they, they, they need. Um, so could, could maybe our witnesses this morning um, set out what their experience has been. Um, Richard Gass, I don't know if you want to, to yeah. start. Well, we're still fairly early into Universal Credit in Glasgow uh, and uh, we've not had too many instances where we've been working with individual service users. We've been hands-on with that service user, so generally able to input into the, the journal that we are uh, mandated. However, we have come across some problems, problems at the stage of uh, trying to make a claim, particularly where there's a, an existing appointee, that appointee's not recognised as the person to act for universal credit purposes and they need to reapply to be that appointee. There's also been experience at the other end where a, where a, a claim is being rejected and the person then wishes to seek her support and unfortunately at that point their journal's been closed down so they've not been able to go online and register us as their as the uh, representative. Fortunately, however, we've, we've had, we're in direct contact with the people, so we're able to make phone calls and have them present and establish uh, identity with DWP. Thank you. Any other witnesses want to see what their experience has been so far? Sheila? Yes, certainly. We have very similar experiences, and we were the first in Scotland to implement a universal credit under the live service. So we have a lot of experience um, of universal credit. It's fair to say it has matured. Um, I think there's quite a bit to go yet, but it has matured in terms of the processes. When it comes to explicit consent, there are real um, problems with explicit consent. And I think for me, the key word in the Information Commissioner's recommendations is the word practical. 
because whilst in theory the explicit consent may seem reasonable to DWP, it's not practical on the ground. And we experience very similar um, situations to what Richard's experiencing in terms of appointees, practical um, support on the ground. Of course, we've got the rural challenges to overcome, um, which I think we'll maybe cover later in this discussion. Um, so th there's real challenges on the ground with um, explicit consent. Okay, thank you. Richard Bailey? Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, and I think the first point that I would like to make, obviously, that from the DWP's position, obviously, they, they're <coughs> pursuing explicit consent because they believe that the, the risks of data breach uh, and it's not safe to, to take the traditional implicit consent. That applies for all legacy benefits that D uh, Universal Credit replaced. And although we're seeing the thin edge of the wedge, and it's actually the, the terms of explicit consent are being ruled out to other benefits such as personal independence payments. Um, now, obviously, I think we would all agree that keeping people's data is safe, uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, but it's often, um, but it's often mistakenly attributed to Aristotle. Uh, but it was from an eighteenth-century philosopher, the aphorism that any virtue when taken to extreme becomes a positive vice. And I think the situation that's more than true here. Because what we have in a situation whereby the, the, the DWP are claiming to try and keep people's data safe, on the ground there is a lot of anecdotal evidence that people, advisors and family members are keeping people's um, usernames and passwords to access their journal in order to be able to, uh, you know, with good intention, obviously, yeah. Now, coming on to, in terms of practica practicalities, like Richard, um, in Edinburgh, we've only been on full service universal credit since November 2018. So we're really just at the beginning of it. But for us, I think there will be, obviously, we're going to be talking about vulnerability, because universal credit obviously has brought in people that would have formerly claimed employment and support allowance. So you're dealing with uh, people that are have physical health problems and mental, cognitive and intellectual impairment. And all of those types of people are going to have problems accessing their journal or coming to see somebody face to face. And it's a feature of many modern um, advice services that they're offering help over the telephone. And that's, that's going to prove problematic in terms of uh, assisting people there and then to get the vital advice and representation that they need. Okay. Is there consistent application of data protection policies and guidelines by DWP across Scotland or, or across the UK and is there is there clarity from DWP in exactly what is required? I hate to be slightly tangential here, my, my office had a situation with an energy company who were using the new GDPR provisions to say that not just myself but every single individual in my office that I employed had to have an individual mandate every single time they sought to contact that energy company on behalf of a constituent. We got that resolved pretty quickly by going to senior management, but it did show how either um, the application of consent rules can be inconsistent, misunderstood by the agency trying to do the right thing, or quite frankly, can be used by an agency to game the system and not necessarily give the help, support and assistance that's needed. In other words, individuals can play games with uh, consent simply not to have to do what a uh, welfare rights officer, whoever, is asking for them to do. So is there any experience about good practice from DWP where they've sought to actually see beyond the rules? Is it inconsistent across the country? And is there any experience of a bit of game playing, quite frankly, in terms of how individual officers within DWP are seeking to interpret data protection issues? Richard? We raised that very question at a Rights of Scotland meeting just last week and round the table had a number of different local authorities present and it was quite surprising that experiences were different and didn't seem to be geographically specific. It seemed to be really down to who you got on the phone and there are indeed some, some staff working in Universal Credit who are adopting a common sense approach and allowing what would be implicit consent, perhaps not with the permission of their, their management, but we heard that some folk were able to get through on the phone without too much difficulty. Others were reporting that they would phone up and it seemed that there was just there was no way, unless it was written in the journal, the, the person that they were speaking to wasn't going to entertain their inquiry. Okay, thank you. Any other thoughts or comments on that, Sheila McCandy? Certainly what we detect is a nervousness on the part of Universal Credit staff. 
um, as if they're unclear as to where the boundaries are. So some are very cautious, and that makes it very difficult, whereas others are more confident in the guidance they've been given. And I think that's what's coming across in terms of the inconsistencies that we're receiving. They are a lot more consistent than they were. Um, and the other point I think is worth making is when we had um, PBS and ADS, when local authorities were delivering that, there was a lot more data share that was possible. And our local job centre staff were tremendous. Um, they were very pragmatic in their approach whilst respecting people's data, and it worked really well. Local authorities have lost that since Help to Claim was introduced in April. So that local data share has been lost, um, and we're reintroduced to another set of challenges that we, we had that predated PBS and ADS. OK, thank you. Richard Bailey? Yeah, if I can add to that, yes. What I would say is that inconsistency is part of the nature of the beast of the DWP, and it is nothing new, it's nothing particularly true of, it's especially true of universal credit than it was with any other benefit. Um, for, for many years, we were operating under implicit consent, and obviously towards the end of the meeting, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But even trying to get that applied consistently was uh, deeply frustrating and problematic. There would be spells, and it seemed like some message had gone out that implicit consent was something that really the, the call handler wasn't that comfortable with um, and there were other periods where it was uh, it was actually it was flowing quite well so there and locally you know when you're experienced and you're phoning up the DWP you're, you're following off doing representation on behalf of, of your clients um, you get to recognize accents and you know that some it would appear anecdotally that some local service centers were if to put it um, politely were over enthusiastically applying the rules to the disadvantage of uh, the representative and the person that they're representing. Now I have to say my experience of individual employees within DWP is actually the vast majority are trying to do a high quality job in hugely difficult circumstances. Now in another inquiry in relation to social security and inward poverty that this committee did, we heard some pretty powerful and compelling evidence from PCS Union about uh, the number of numbers of employees uh, working with DWP, about the the workload and the stress they were under, and the lack of resources. So I'm just wondering, Mr. Bailey. I mean, you can't maybe comment in any particular detail, but my concern would be that if you're an under-resourced, overstretched member of the DWP working with Job Centre Plus in a service centre or wherever, and you have 10 different demands in your time, um, and you can only do one thing, if five of them is a query in relation to explicit and implicit consent, those get bagged, those get sidelined. I would agree. And yeah. it might not even be about deliberately gaming the system, no. it's cherry picking the things they can do and can do quickly and maybe more vulnerable people uh, are, are losing out as a consequence. So could a resourcing issue of staffing at DWP lead to a more stringent um, interpretation of some of these uh, rules, do you think? Yeah, we concur with that and I would also start off by saying and all the, t all the benefits that I've dealt with, I would say that the staff, the call handlers for Universal Credit are the most pleasant and appear to be the most helpful in terms of their attitude, in terms of that first line customer um, customer service experience that I've ever experienced. And I don't know if my, my colleagues concur. So there's been lots of effort to try and treat people with what the Scottish Social Security system is trying to do as well, dignity and respect. There's been a lot, I think there's been a lot of good work done there. But I would agree from a bureaucratic point of view, if you're under pressure, yes, there are certain things that are easy to easier to sideline than others. And you've got a stock response. Why? How can I kick this down the can is a common expression that we're hearing in politics at the moment. How can I kick this um, inquiry down the can? Can I get the person to call me back some other time because I've got 15 calls waiting on me and a manager breathing down my back? Any other comments in relation to that, um, Richard Gass? And the individuals in the DWP certainly not had a, had a problem with them, both at call handling and at, at, at management, local level. Uh, so no, not, not, not a problem there. 
what's the point I was going to make there, but I've kind of just distracted myself. So yeah. we can come back to you. Bring Sheila McCandy in, and then just just come in again after that. It'll, 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 it will absolutely come back to you. I'm, sh I'm sure, <laughs> Sheila. I'm glad it's not just me that happens to. Um, yes, I think there's a couple of things that we are certainly detecting, um, and I've now just forgotten the first one, but it will come back to me. <laughs> um, DWP introduced on the 4th of June, um, they, they improved their automated voice recognition system. Um, what was happening is the, the way the system was originally designed, when somebody phoned the 800 number, they had to wait until the end of the message to select which option they were choosing. And customers and advisors weren't doing that, and they were trying to intervene throughout the process. And that was routing calls incorrectly to advisors in the call centres. And of course, that was adding to the stress and the workload. Um, of call centre staff um, and increasing the demands upon them. And I would just echo what my colleagues are saying in, in terms of the individual member of staff, they're highly professional um, and really are trying to do what we're trying to do, which is do the right thing for the client and the claimant. Um, the first thing I was going to say was uh, quite often with DWP, it's a case of whoever shouts loudest gets dealt with. And as a result, the more vulnerable clients do tend to fall to the bottom because they're unable to articulate um, the issues for themselves. And that's when they do come to advisors and they need the support. And that's when implicit consent is so important. And that's because we're, that's why we're having so many challenges through explicit consent. And that's why there does need to be some change. Yeah. Now I've got one final question, but before I ask it, Mr. Gast, do you want to come back in? So I, I, I have remembered, so let's do it now. We sometimes find that when we're trying to get through on the phone and we've got the, the appellant or the claimant present so we can have explicit consent over the telephone that we can't get through on the phone. And then as a result, we then need to phone back afterwards. Now, obviously, if we can't get through on the phone, that would indicate that at DWP, they've got a larger volume of calls. So when we finally do get on the phone, we've no longer got our person present. And it's at that point we then run into the barrier of not being able to establish implicit consent because that's not a, a, a feature of universal credit. That's very helpful. It's quite helpful that it's putting day-to-day -day issues on, on the table to committee members rather than talking in the abstract. abstract. There was one final question. I was going to raise it, raise it later, but Sheila McCandy made reference to it uh, during um, one of your replies, and that was in relation to the Help to Claim system uh, and universal credit, and, and we mentioned protected date of claim issues as well. So just for anyone following the evidence session uh, who might not be clear on that, as of the 1st of April, uh, anyone who was seeking to submit a universal, a fresh, a new universal credit claim who couldn't f submit it that day were, were only protected from the final date their claim was submitted, whereas before the 1st of April, uh, as soon, depending on what agency you were working with, uh, as soon as you opened a universal credit claim, irrespective of when that final form was submitted, you were covered in relation to backdating. Of benefit. I know Glasgow City Council told our committee that using data from your universal credit hubs and the network of libraries across the city, you estimated that meant that 200 vulnerable claimants each month were going to lose out on money that they otherwise would get because of the change of the rules under help to claim as of the 1st of April. Now, as we approach the end of June, that's 600, many of them my constituents in Glasgow, who will have lost out because of this in the first three months. I'm just wondering if in relation, and bringing it back to what we're here for today, if one of the reasons that there may be a delay from opening a universal credit claim to submitting the final forum might be some more vulnerable claimants don't have all the information at hand. You may have to actually contact DWP to speak to DWP to clarify a number of things about the claimant and the constituent. And if they turn around and say, sorry, we can't talk to you about this because we don't have implicit consent anymore, there needs to be explicit and you can't prove who you are. Actually, has the GDPR issues made this situation even worse? Because if you open a claim on the Monday, you try to get information from DWP on the Monday and they say, sorry, we can't talk to you or you can't get through to someone on the phone. It could be another 10, 11, 12 days before you see that client again to then get that information. So are issues under the loss of protected date of claim been exacerbated by issues in relation to consent? And more generally, I'd be very interested to know, because I'm very clear in the situation in Glasgow, 
Uh, but what the situation with loss of protected data of claim has feel, feels like, not just in Glasgow, but maybe Edinburgh, else, elsewhere within Scotland. Any thoughts and comments on that, Mr Gass? Again, Gass? We, we had a, a conversation about this because the, the change was the, the, the transfer of the, the resource to Citizens Advice and Citizens Advice Scotland. And when it was a delivery partnership agreement with the specific local authorities, we, when we were providing that support, were doing so under some kind of agency agreement with DWP and therefore any delays that happened because we couldn't make the claim in, in a, a, a set period. The point of contact with ourselves was the date of claim. Now, that didn't apply across the board. Folk who found their own way to a welfare rights officer to make a, a universal credit claim wasn't so protected. But it does seem the case that when this has been transferred to citizens' advice, that that... that that facility has been lost for whatever reason. And I can't imagine that it was a, a, an intention. I, I would imagine it's perhaps more of an oversight. Uh, and certainly I, I can't imagine that citizen advice are particularly happy that folk who now come to see them, if there's a delay, will find that, they're, that the, the, the clients have lost out. What we've discovered from round our table discussion was that where there had been referrals to citizens' advice in Scotland so far to the CABs, there was no delay at this point in time. There was capacity to see somebody promptly. Our worry will be that that might not be sustainable as more and more folk are looking to claim universal credit. But hopefully Citizens Advice Scotland and Citizens Advice nationally can engage with the government to overcome what hopefully is only a, an administrative oversight. Over to other witnesses in, you were saying that under help to claim, my understanding is that citizens' advice have not been flooded with claimants going through the, the help to claim scheme, so they absolutely have capacity, and anyone watching, go and see a local citizens' advice bureau and get the support you need. But do you have any feeling about whether citizens' advice bureau are able to get that claim processed and submitted in the same day? Because if they don't, it doesn't matter how much capacity they've got, people are still losing out money. And in practice, from, from our own team, we would not be sending somebody to the CAB. We'd be doing it with the person there and then. Uh, but I imagine it's maybe other, other agencies that don't provide welfare rights support that are sending folk to the to, to CAB. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you perhaps need to speak to citizens' advice to get that, that directly. We would keep our work in-house. We know that we're up against the clock, mm -hmm. so we need to press that button, and we'll look to do that. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I should put on the record, our committee has written constructively to Amber Rudd, because we very much hope this is an oversight as well and that this can can be fixed. I'm conscious we have had no reply back for Amber Rudd. Maybe that's something as a committee we have to follow up uh, pretty strenuously to, to if, if it is indeed an oversight, we can fix this quickly. But I suppose the underlying question, and I'll bring other witnesses in in a second, the underlying question was whether or not in those advice hubs that you have in Glasgow, uh, your advisors are having issues with getting through and getting consent over the phone to get the information they need to file a successful claim under universal credit? I, I don't have uh, information for you on that. I just know that in the hub, they will be seeking to make the claim promptly. If there's missing information, it'll be because the, the person hasn't got maybe, I don't know, uh, their, uh, their bank details. So that's not information that you're going to get from from DWP, in those scenarios, we would be putting in effectively default information just to met, just to take you to the point where you can press the claim button. So you don't have a mobile phone number; it'll enter a set a set of zeros. So we can press the claim button, and then when we've got the journal up and running, add the extra information in at that point. Okay, that's very helpful. A any additional comments from uh, Sheila or Richard in relation to these matters? I would just Sheila. add that um, the experience of the Citizens Advice Scotland in Highland is exactly the same. So the, the referrals they're receiving from the Job Centre, for example, are at a low level at the moment. So people are being able to submit their claims that same day where the evidence is available. But as you've already pointed out, Chair, um, the very vulnerable clients don't always have that information to hand for, for a number of reasons. Um, and that's where the delay comes in. Um, certainly, the Highland Council's welfare support team, we do have challenges in terms of contacting DWP when there's a particularly complex claim. Um, quite often, people have got mental health, disabilities, physical disabilities, 
and also other complex needs. So there might be drug addiction, there might be alcohol reliance, and um, there might be other complexities going on in that household or the wider household. Um, so there are real difficulties um, in dealing with those more complex claims, and there are delays. And I think that there is a potential going forward that this is really going to hit in terms of um, the date of claim and it not being protected, the unprotection. I think the capacity over time will be a real challenge for Citizens Advice Scotland, um, and obviously they'll have to have those discussions with DWP. Okay, thank you. Before I move to other, other questions, uh, Richard Bailey, anything you want to add? I think the, b both both their experiences have been mirrored in Edinburgh, but what I would, obviously, and I was going to make it in, in connection with the previous point, and it's valid for this as well, let's not forget that of the two stated aims for universal credit, one of them is to save money to the public purse. And one does wonder that if it could be an oversight, but it could be yet another way of... Um, disentitling people for a period of time, which, when you add it up, the number of vulnerable people could bring in some form of saving. And again, I think that also applies to the issue of consent, because re people given advice, representatives, we are there. Our job is to ensure that people get their full entitlement from the earliest possible date. Now, that's a cost to the government, and I do actually start to wonder and muse on whether uh, explicit consent and the, the changes to the protected date of claim are there to reduce the amount paid in benefit. OK. <coughs> Thank you for putting that on the record. Uh, I should point out, when we made representations to uh, Amber Rudd, we did so uh, as a committee, including more Conservative members, and our default position at the moment is that this is an oversight and we can address this and that we can fix this. Um, if we can, then the committee will have to think long and hard about if there are any other reasons. But right now, we'll get unanimity as a committee to, to, to tackle this issue. But thank you for putting that on the record. Matt Griffin. Thanks, Kevin. I just wanted to ask witnesses about how easy it is or isn't to get explicit consent. The DWP have said um, it, it's a much simpler process. It's as easy as just um, putting a, a note on the journal and, and everything's OK. What, what are witnesses' experience of that? Who are digitally capable, then yes, that is that's a very quick way in the past to get a quick mandate in. You had to fax it in. Now you can have it in the journal immediately. So for folk who are able to use their, their account, able to log in, no problem. If there's folk who are present in the office, again, no problem, subject to being able to get through on the phone. The problem is where you've got someone who comes in to see you who can't stay for other pressing reasons or the phoned up they've not had their money, they're not able to make it in, and they want someone to help them. So it is the vulnerable, the most vulnerable, that are disadvantaged by the need for explicit consent. If it was implicit consent, and we're phoning up saying, we both know that Mrs Smith's having a problem with her benefits, I'm here to try and help her, then why can we not be believed to be acting in the person's best interest? The current process assumes that the claimant has got access to their journal. It's not always the case. There could be connectivity issues, there could be accessibility issues, there could be affordability issues. They might not have credit on their phone, for example. These are all the practical issues. I keep going back to the word practical. These are the practical issues that our claimants, our clients are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so it's not as simple as just logging into your journal. Same challenges with making a telephone call affordability issues come in there. It's a free phone number, but if you don't have credit on your phone to begin with, it's very difficult to engage. So what happens there is um, these individuals need the support of services, advice services through, th through the sector. Um, but of course, in Highland, we've got the rural challenges. They could be quite a distance away from a local agency. So again, there's more delay built into that. So all the time, what we're, what we're seeing in Highland is the system is working against people, it's not working for people. The system is very good for those individuals who can do for themselves. What it's not been designed for and doesn't cater for is the, the vulnerable clients who have got the, the complex needs. I think I would focus on um, putting, putting explicit consent into, into the journal. Um, now, if it was an easier process, then perhaps there, there, is so, there, there is some benefit to it because the previous, the previous method would be getting a client to sign a mandate and send it in 
and that mandate would go via Wolverhampton and get uh, buried underground for, for a couple of weeks and maybe never appear where it needs to appear. Uh, so the principle of being able to, if you're digitally literate or indeed uh, you know, other forms of literacy come to it as well, um, if you're able to do that uh, and get through some of the other hurdles, then fine. But I think I would say approximately about a third of my claimants who I'm dealing with face to face cannot remember their login details. Now, I would suspect that's true of every single one of us round here. At times, we've forgotten our login details for a piece of vital information. And it's especially true if you've got literacy issues, if you're a foreign national with limited English. Um, and obviously, Universal Credit is now bringing in people who were with a formerly claimed employment and support allowance. So again, you're getting a higher proportion of people with physical, mental intellectual and cognitive disabilities as well. So th there's those issues. And uh, there are issues obviously extending that. What if someone's in hospital um, where they, they may not be physically well enough? Uh, even if they do have the connectivity, even if they do have the technology, they couldn't physically use a keyboard or a telephone. Whereas possibly previously, they might have just about been able to put an X on a mandate. Um, so there's that issue as well. Um, And again, in terms of in terms of this IT literacy is a big thing, and I tried to find some statistics on that, and I, I struggled. Uh, but what I what I did uh, what I did come across is we're looking in terms of adults across the United Kingdom, we're looking at a, a level for adults of about a fifteen percent of functional literacy, and that's that's excluding IT. And I suspect with IT, it's a lot higher. And again, even more so. For, for, for claimants, uh, a high, it would be a higher proportion of claimants on, on universal credit. I mean, I think it's clear that the, the digital by default um, way of operating isn't, isn't working for um, a high number of universal credit claimants, but just how simple is it for those who do have the IT skills, who do have um, good um, connectivity? We've heard um, previously about um, things in journals um, not being actioned, being missed, just because of the the high workload of work coaches. Has it always gone um, smoothly, even for those who do have um, good IT skills and easy access to their journal? Does that still always work? I'm not a hands-on advisor any longer, so I don't have first-hand experience, but I know that people from my own staff, when they go in and they're helping folk access the journal, it's maybe a bit strange the first two or three times that once you've done it with regularity, you do know how to get into your journal and there's requirements on claimants to put information in their journal all the time, except to the point that there'll be information going into the journal that the DWP might not act on. However, if we're phoning up to say, if you look at the journal, you'll see that we're mandated to do this, then that will draw a focus to that and they'll... I've not, I've not, I'm not aware of any occasions where there's explicit consent in the journal which DWP failed to see. Okay. Okay. In our experience, um, the people that it works for, we don't see. It's the people it doesn't work for who come and access local authority services and uh, systems advice services, and it doesn't always work. Um, either the claimant doesn't understand the message that's been sent to them on their journal, or the messages they are sending in to DWP are not being acted upon or are being misunderstood and it goes into the sort of like an email chain that both sides aren't understanding and there's a bit of miscommunication between the two so it probably is working for many people um, but the people who we see it's not working for and that's why they've come to our services in the first place. The first point I would like to raise about that is that the National Association of Welfare Rights Advisors um, um, put, put um, put points across to the Department for Work and Pensions to an order that the consent was easy for staff and the DWP to, to see straight away, get it pinned close to the top. So I'm hoping that that's an issue that's now resolved and that the, um, that the, 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 the call centre staff are able to see that information rather than saying, well, where is it? Um, so they've got that. But g given your, your hypothetical scenario, where everything's perfect, every person's got connectivity, they're able to use it. I still think there, there are remaining issues, and this is directly from um, 
from the government's um, guidance on universal credit consent and disclosure of information. If you're giving explicit consent on, on the journal for the record, I'd say that it's telling you to give consent to your personal information to be shared with your representative, outline what information you want to be disclosed, explain why the information is needed, explain the re representative's relationship to you, whether the representative is your family member or friend, and it gets worse, uh, give the name of the representative and the organisation, including branch where applicable. If you cannot provide the name of the representative, you need to be as specific as possible. For example, you should provide uh, re the representative's job role uh, or team name within the organisation. And that's going to be challenging for a lot of people to do that. So even with ev if everything is perfect, there is still a number of significant hurdles to get over. Okay, thank that does seem like a very high high burden. Um, can we move on to a, a different area, um, convener. Um, Contact Scotland um, BSL is a government-funded video relay interpreting service for deaf BSL users. Now, the funding for that was, um, up until the start of this month, was purely to access um, Scottish public service services, but it has now been um, given additional funding as, and has rolled out to access um, all public services and, in fact, uh, any private services that a deaf um, BSL user would want to, to access. How easy would it be for um, a deaf BSL user using a, a video um, really interpreting service to give um, consent um, for their interpreter to discuss their case. We have a BSL specialist within the Highland Council um, and we have made use of um, our colleague for a universal credit claim. I wasn't present so I don't have uh, that insight to it but the feedback I got was it was very successful. Um, and it, it helped immensely. Um, so I don't know how they navigated through the system. I'm sorry, I can't share that with you. But that, the feedback I got was, was very good. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Okay, uh, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning. Um, just two or three questions, if I could explore them. With. The first one is: once you have the consent granted, is that an indefinite consent? Or do you have to renew it? And how often do you have to renew it? And is that different from what was previous? Yes, it's different from what was previous. That uh, consent now is only for a specific period and needs to be renewed. Again, for folk who have easy access to their journal, capable to use their journal, then that's relatively easy to, to replicate. However, where someone has greater problems, and as relying on the advice service to fix it all for them and has provided consent, then the expiry of consent would be a, a, a major a major hurdle. I don't have any experience any evidence today of scenarios where the 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 authorization has expired. <coughs> but if it were to expire then that would be a problem. It would certainly would be a problem. How long does the do you know how long it lasts? There's a suggestion it's a number of weeks and it would not last for more than two uh, payments. So if folk are being paid monthly, then the maximum it could last would be between five and eight weeks. But again, I don't... Maybe my colleagues have got experience with expiry. Two assessment... Well, just slightly under two assessment periods. So when the, the consent is given, it covers that assessment period, which is one calendar month, and it would cover the next assessment period as well. But very often, and again, like, like Richard, no direct experience, but we have our experience with the legacy benefits and we know that it can take many months to resolve even just one issue. And often with benefits, uh, issues are inter interconnected. So solving one thing leads potentially there are multiple issues with a person's claim. So it could easily take longer than two months, so therefore the person would be required to renew that. Yeah to that is, um, is until the matter is resolved. Now, with universal credit, you think you've solved it until the payment doesn't appear or an incorrect payment appears or there's been a deduction that you weren't aware of. So it's still a very much a live issue for the claimant, but it's been closed down because in DWP's mind, the issue has been resolved, but it's not. I, I, I think I heard uh, Richard Bailey saying, can I just clarify, this is not just for universal credit. 
this is for legacy benefits and also presumably now for uh, new applications for PIP, DLE, attendance allowance. Is, is this consent uh, across the board for all benefits or no, is it just for universal credit? I think what's happening is that um, uh, for the legacy benefits, um, the, the, the benefits that universal credit has replaced and for those that were always intended to be outside the system, I feel that like there has been a bit of leakage, that uh, the, the other benefits are taking their lead incorrectly um, from universal credit and trying to enforce some form of explicit consent, whereas they should still be using the, the implicit consent and the working, for, working with a representative document that's been around for at least 15 years. So just clarify, I didn't really put that. So if I apply for PIP now, is it explicit consent or not? It shouldn't be. But in practice, is it happening? I haven't come across personally any experiences of it. I mean, our situation would be that we would get somebody to sign a mandate and we would submit that with their form, but then it, that, that, that becomes, because it's not a low, and we will come on to this, a low would be very much strongly advocating for implicit consent. It still wasn't a perfect system, um, and, but we would be taking them, our service would take a mandate and, uh, and send that in. Um, but I haven't, I phoned up PIP, recently frequently and I haven't had any particular problems myself uh, with using implicit consent but I understand colleagues, uh, member, other members of national, uh, the NORA have ac across the United Kingdom. Okay, uh, and just to broaden it slightly so that we can have a fuller picture, I mean obviously it may be too new but obviously we've got a new Scottish security agency up and running and you know that some of you will be dealing with benefit claims in due course. Do you know, are they looking for implicit or is it implied consent? Are they been in touch with you about that going forward and do you know how that's going to work? There have been no discussions with us regarding explicit implicit consent and we're working very closely with the agency in terms of introducing um, the social security benefits. Um, so I'm not aware that they are contemplating explicit consent. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Okay, Alistair Allen. Thank you, Convener. Um, one of the things... Um, that uh, Sheila McCandy was saying there about rurality, uh, and I'm sure this is relevant to, to other people um, in front of the committee today, um, is about some of the difficulties where it's not practical for, for people to, to get into uh, a local office. Uh, we have received written evidence about this situation, um, talking about this um, and the, the difficulties of people in remote and rural areas. Um, it was put to us that um, people can make uh, th arrangements for a three-way call between themselves, a representative and the DWP to verify their ID. Now, on the face of it, that sounds like a very, very complicated thing to arrange just to identify yourself. Is that what's happening and how does that work? I could perhaps speak from a rural perspective. Um, this facility has been available for a very long time. I think actually since we introduced live service um, a way back in those days, we have never made use of this facility because our clients just cannot cope with the system. Um, the very reason they're a client of a local authority or citizens advice is because they cannot deal with these issues themselves. So the three-way calling certainly doesn't work in Highland. Well, that's certainly very interesting to hear because it's... Oh, sorry, sorry, beg your pardon. Experiences of that, right? No. No, okay. it's okay. Chile's experience. Okay. Well, I just wonder if, if others on the panel have any knowledge of this being used. I'm aware of its existence, but not aware of anyone having made any use of it. Well, that, that's certainly very interesting to hear because I mean that it was put to us um, that this is a is a useful means of, of people identifying themselves. It doesn't, frankly, sound like it is. So. Uh, I mean, for people who are living 50 or 100 miles from their nearest centre, um, as you'll be familiar in, in the Highlands, um, what are people supposed to do to identify themselves? If, this, if people are unaware of this, I mean, is there any effort being made to make people aware of this by the DWP themselves? I'm not aware of DWP making people aware of it. I mean, we certainly do advise people the facilities there, but very quickly they say, oh, I can't cope with that. That's why I need you. Um, what, what we do in Highland, um, my team actually have got mobile technology and go to people's homes. And that's how we facilitate the system in, um, in Highland. It does mean that Highland Council is um, incurring a lot of cost in terms of the travel and time to get to people. But without that service, 
these people would not be able to access universal credit. As you say, they're 50 to 100 miles away from a centre. They don't have the money, they don't, their public transport isn't there. Um, they cannot access local services from where they are, so we have to take our services to them. But from what you're just saying there, nonetheless, DWP think it's the role of others to pay for that intervention of the kind that you're talking about to actually make people find the, the, the system accessible? Certainly, um, we get a lot of people referring themselves to the Highland Council Support Service and citizen advice. Um, DWP do have a visiting service, and I think that's across the board. They've got a visiting service. How well that's used, I don't know. I don't have any statistics in terms of how regularly that service is called upon. But um, my team in, in Highland Council are out every single day in people's homes helping with the universal credit um, process. And I think the other thing to, to say to the committee is when individuals in legacy benefits, it used to be somebody would come for support, we'd help them through the claim process, help them through the appeal process, and then they'd be on their way. That's not our experience with universal credit. It's not a, a one-time service. Um, people come to our service, they get support with appealing, with application, and then they come back because there's either a deduction taken off that they, they don't understand, or the level of deduction is putting them into hardship. Um, there's sanctions, possibly. The complexities around universal credit is something that we've not seen before in terms of the advice sector. So finally, on this, and this again is, is addressed to others on the panel who may have a, a view about this, the, the change to universal credit, has it had a, a marked impact in terms of the problems associated with rurality? It certainly has in Highland. Yes, I can only speak from a Highland perspective. Um, it has in terms of delivering the service because it's universal credit, of course, is modelled on digital by default and DWP have lost that terminology, but it is still digital by default. And as I've sort of outlined before, um, there's real connectivity issues, there's the skills issues, there's affordability issues, there's the accessing local services challenges in Highland. So there's real rural challenges um, which... DWP have tried to work with us on, um, and you'll be aware of the Skype facilities that have been put into Highland, and we've got that in one of the Highland Council's local service points, this is a one-stop shop, and in our Kinloch Burvey Citizens Advice, a tremendous facility, and I'd love to see it rolled out much further. Um, we do need to support that, so our welfare advisor is in our service point office where the Skype facility is, and we do support clients through the whole process, um, but it's a fantastic facility, and our local job centre who are servicing that Skype facility, um, very positive feedback from them as well. On Alistair, I, I'm conscious that um, Sheila had an expertise in relation to, to rural issues, but I've also been now joined by Sandra Stewart. Sandra, lo lovely to see you, and I know you had some challenges getting here this morning. Just remind the committee that Sandra is a device worker with Family Advice and Information Resource, and you, you've not really had the opportunity to put anything on the record yet, even if it's not particularly specific to uh, Alistair Allen's line of questioning. I mean, obviously, he, he was interrogating barriers to to accessing service issues around explicit implicit consent rurality, rurality it doesn't have to necessarily be around that but i just want to afford you the opportunity to put some some <coughs> remarks to, to the committee this morning thank you um we work at fair with people with learning disability and their carers and family members um universal credit for us has been incredibly problematic um, because of the type of client group that we work with. We're fortunate enough in that most of our clients are still on legacy benefits and will probably remain there for some time and hopefully be managed migrations. Um, but the, the difficulties we have uh, are things like, you know, we have clients who don't read or write. <coughs> um, so... Normally, they would just, if they received a letter, they would take it to us, we would phone up, um, and we would speak to someone from DWP about it. Um, that's been so difficult. Um, pa clients are unable to remember passwords, so actually even speaking to someone on a telephone, most of our claims so far have been phone claims, have not been online claims, because our clients can't use... Uh, technology. Uh, most of them won't have mobile phones. Uh, they tend to lose mobile phones even if they do have them. Um, 
So, yeah, it's just... I, I think we've probably got about 10 clients so far on Universal Credits, and the time that it's taken us to deal with these clients has tripled. Um, I mean, there are clients who need quite a lot of support generally anyway, um, but, you know, the, the time involved is now um, just increased dramatically. And have you, have you noticed, uh, I just want to give the opportunity to some of this on the record, we've got about 25 minutes or so left of this evidence session, uh, have you noticed uh, a, a much more challenging time period in the last few months in relation to the interpretation of data protection rules um, by the DWP? Could you say a little bit about that and maybe what would be helpful in making it easier and more accessible for the, the individuals that you, that you represent? I, I think the easiest thing would be either to go back to... Um, implicit consent so that we can actually speak to someone or to actually have a paper authorisation so we can get someone to sign. We have lots of clients who, who will have a dual diagnosis of learning disability and autism who suffer from severe anxiety and can't speak on telephones. Um, so actually even speaking to someone to say that they give their consent for us to speak on their behalf is really difficult for them. They can sign a bit of paper, so mandates were really useful for us. Um, or implicit consent where we didn't even really need to have the client with us. Um, but, yeah, it's just... Um, it's been a, a, a nightmare, to be honest. Um, and we've had situations where we've got clients to, to say that they want... Um, us to speak on their behalf and it's been pinned to the system and it's been ignored um, and DWP have continued then to send text messages to people who can't read um, so they're having to come in with phones to get us to read the phone and then to make calls on their behalf um, yeah. Okay. I want to give you the opportunity to put that on the record we'll continue with the, the kind of lines of questioning we've been having but I just didn't want you to miss out your opportunity to, to, to make sure the official report caught, caught some of that we'll move to Keith Brown, MSP now Yes, um, <clears throat> I see the commissioners mentioned the unduly restrictive nature of um, explicit consent and particularly the situation regarding MSPs now not being able to access this I was interested in the point that Mr Gass made earlier on about if the person was there with the advisor, in this case I'm talking about an MSP or the staff, and then he could often, that would often be sufficient, uh, whereas the experience in my office is that doesn't work. We've had constituents very distressed, perhaps having been refused, um, sitting with me or, or a member of staff and the DWP refusing um, that. So the system doesn't seem to be working for them. I just wondered, given uh, what's been said and the attempts that have been made to try and overcome this both from within the parliament, I think Linda Fabiani and others, what your view on is, it, it is on the restriction on MSPs being involved and also in the context of both the UK government regularly says the government should work together, the parliament should work together. Is this serving the people that need these services well, I suppose, is my question. My, my view is that the elected members from either Scotland or the UK parliament should both have the same uh, right to, to explicit consent. We'd or implicit consent and our preference would be for that to be extended to advisors too but I can see no reason why you would not allow an MSP to have implicit consent and going forward when we're going to have uh, devolved be more devolved benefits in the Scottish Parliament uh, it w MPs presumably would wish to have implicit consent so I can't see why what, what, how people are served by only having certain elected members able to make use of this I would say, yeah, I don't see the justification at all for, for excluding MSPs from that, but I would also roll it out further and say that local authority councillors should be, also be included as elected representatives. And invariably, in terms of the work that we do with MPs, uh, it, it does get delegated to their incredibly hardworking staff, and I'm sure you and the MSPs have the same hardworking staff who would put a good deal of effort. And it does prove incredibly fruitful because MPs can get a level of detail of response from the Department for Work and Pensions that us guys, they, they just wouldn't respond in that depth to us, yeah? Uh, and it allows us to get a full case overview of what's going on and then we can intervene with air advice, representation and expertise of social security law to take forward any potential challenges and hopefully get a successful outcome um, 
for, for, for a person in terms of their claim to benefit. So, yeah, definitely. And also, um, again, it's like bias here. Obviously, I'm a local authority welfare rights officer. Um, if it was extended to local authority councillors, we could perhaps then say, well, we're actually staffed to the councillors, therefore implicit consent would also apply to us. But yes, it just it makes no sense and is of no support to people who need the vital help there and then. WP to regulations 22 and 23 of the DPA 2018 Act, and the same provisions existed in the, the Act before that, which clearly states that an elected representative, whether at UK level, Scottish level or local level, should be treated the same and should have the same access rights when it comes to pr processing data. So we think the provisions are there, we think the rights are there, we think it's DWP who are misapplying those regulations. Any additional comments on that? We, we tend to use M MPs as sort of a, a last resort when we're really struggling with cases, um, and, and that's always been fruitful. Um, you know, if, th if that's no longer there, it's going to just make our job much harder. Okay. Keith, do you want to follow up on some of that? I, I'm just really interested in the point that was made about the existing provisions, which really begs the question as to why this restrictive approach has now been adopted, what the purpose is or the idea behind it is. And if the idea... Um, Let's be charitable and say it was for uh, a genuine regard for the data of the individuals. It strikes me as odd. I, I've written to the UK government recently on a reserve matter and they passed my letter on behalf of my constituents to the MP, which my constituents specifically did not want. And um, so that their protection of data mm -hmm. and without wandering too far away, if you look at what MI5 and MI6 have been doing in the last week or so, then protection of data doesn't seem to be a strong point. But on the point that's made about councillors, I, I understand and I would support that. Although would it not be the case that the councillors would tend to, I suppose DWP in any government agency has to have some ability to regulate where the data goes. Would the point of access from councillors be through people like yourself? If, if, if the officers within the council's money advice services were known to, if you like, accredited almost by the DWP, then the, the councillors could go through that acknowledged and trusted route. Well, the, the, the way that I would envisage it working would be that, you know, in terms of the obviously, because you're looking at for you guys when you're when you've got constituents coming to you with problems, as do MPs, as do councillors, that then that that case would then be as you would do, refer to your staff, or as MPs would do, refer to their staff that lo the count local councillor, and as they do and ha have done since that, since I've been working in the local authority, they would pass that 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 query onto the people who can get it resolved. So that that would be the channel rather than the councillor, MSP or MP being bypassed, it would go to the your constituent would be going to them in the first instance and then the, the staff would be doing the follow-up work. Okay. Um, now, I don't think there's a bid for supplementaries on this specific point. Uh, the, the next theme of question will be, uh, be Alison, just to give you kind of heads up on that, but if it's on this specific point, I saw Alistair, Alan and Shona Robinson. So to Alistair then Shona. Okay, thank you, convener. Um, it was really just to observe um, that the Scottish Government have made representations about this issue and it doesn't sound from what's been said today as if the DWP are responding to that um, very actively. But um, I was just interested in one of the things that was, was said there earlier on about some of the, the vulnerable groups um, who are accessing services. Um, there, there seems to be, there seems to be a, a, an, an assumption that, that people will be so interested and versed in the Scotland Act that they will know which uh, benefits are devolved and which ones are reserved in terms of who they actually go to. Is it, is it a reasonable idea that people should go to an elected representative on the basis that they know which parts of the Scotland Act devolve which benefits? That's a loaded question. Uh, um, no. I, 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 I think uh, via the power of mime, I was able to ascertain that, that, that all the witnesses agree with you with the, 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 their body movements and, and shaking their heads. Is any additional that's questions? That's enough. Right. Uh, that's, one point I would say. Right. Maybe that's one other issue that they've overlooked in, in respect to the points you were making in connection okay. with uh, preserved and preserving data claims. Could could be that they've overlooked it. Yeah, and, and I know we're going to look more at vulnerable constituents um, and members of society shortly and how the system does or doesn't work for them. Um, Shona Robinson, you did a supplementary on a specific point as well. 
Yes, I, I, I note that the response from uh, Damien Green uh, in 2017, trying to justify the exception for MPs and not others, is he said, uh, we can offer this because of our pre-existing relationships between MPs, offices, district managers and their teams. This is something which cannot pertain for inquiries from other sources. Now, um, I'd like to think, and I know that my office in Dundee has a, a, a very good relationship with the local uh, DWP office and staff and that, that is a relationship going back a number of years. Uh, I've been a, an MSP for 20 years now and it, so it's a long-standing relationship and um, I, uh, well apart from that being extremely challengeable um, statement from Damien Green, um, I think I would want to put on the record that actually the local staff still try and accommodate inquiries for the sake of the constituent and it appears to me that the, the thwarting of that is certainly not coming from local staff who are trying to work with us but certainly from higher up and I think it's important maybe to, to make that distinction. Um, that this is a, 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 a political uh, decision that appears um, to have been made against the wishes often of local staff as well. Um. Okay, um, I, I think that that was good to put on the record. I don't know if there was a question on that. Was maybe just kind of putting that stuff on the record. Before we move on, I think it's also worth um, also putting on the record, in my experience in relation to all elected representatives in this place, it's not about a turf war between different elected representatives or a status or a hierarchy. It's actually about the individuals that, that come to see us and about trust and relationship building. And it really doesn't matter from, certainly from my point of view, as a councillor, an MP or an MSP, if you've got the trust and you've got the relationship, then you should be able to have that implicit, implied consent and just get on with helping people as best you can. I, I know there's not a, a turf war issue amongst the elected representatives that I see. We just want to help people and we feel that there's barriers to that just now that are, that are, that are not justifiable. So I thank you for your support in, in relation to the comments you, you, you've made in, in relation to that, Alison Johnson. Um, yeah, thank you. I think there has been, um, quite rightly, a focus on the impact this may have on particularly vulnerable members of society. Um, I. I I have a strong impression from this morning's evidence that, that all of your organisations are now finding it more difficult to help people with their claims, and particularly vulnerable people. You probably are aware that the Information Commissioner's Office in uh, April gave a view on the DWP's approach, um, uh, which said the DWP appears to be taking an unduly restrictive view, which has been mentioned, of the definition of consent under data protection. Um, and that there hasn't been given enough importance given to ensuring that vulnerable persons aren't prejudiced as a result of the interpretation of the DWP's policy on this topic. Um, I just wonder if you could give your views on the on the Information Commissioner offices, you know, on that intervention. And um, we'd like to think that might be helpful in turning things around. On the impact this is having on negative. N the negative impact it's having on vulnerable people and whether you think there are sufficient safeguards in place to ensure that they're not any more negatively impacted than they already are. We, we would support the, the, the comments from the Information Commissioner that the DWP should not be so restrictive. The reason why folk are coming to advise services in the first place is a is by and large because of a, a vulnerability that they can't navigate the benefit system confidently on their own, on their own to require another person. So we shouldn't have artificial barriers in the way to them engaging the service. And the more vulnerable a person is, they might not especially relish and enjoy their time with their advisor. They might just want it to be, look, I can't deal with this. I've given you the information. Please sort it out and not have to come back. So the more vulnerable somebody is, the, the lack of ability for advisors to do their job is something that I think we should all unite to, to overcome. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I actually think we'll, we'll have clients who will completely disengage with the benefit system because it's, it's um, going to be so difficult for them now. Um, and also because we can't advocate on their behalf. Um, We'll, we'll have clients who just, as I said, who can't speak on telephones, can't use technology. That This system just isn't suitable at all for people with their, with their type of needs. 
Um, do you think, are there any exceptions being applied to take account of this? I mean, should there not be some sort of marker on an individual's record where, where this clearly isn't going to work? There are safeguards in place, um, which, which set out very similar safeguards that local authorities have in place for discretionary housing payments. Um, so it looks like things like learning difficulties, um, drug addiction, dependencies, it looks at all of that. I think the difficulty is the application of that. It, it's very generic. Um, service centre staff, again, going back to this confidence thing, they, they don't have the confidence to always apply it. So we quite often get into long discussions with DWP about when the safe safeguards should apply. Um, I mean, at the very basic level, somebody in rent arrears is vulnerable because they're at risk of losing their home. Um, yeah. So it's where do those safeguards stop and start? Um, how are they applied? What's the consistency of application? So yes, there are provisions that DWP have put in place for safeguarding. It's the application of them that's throwing up the difficulties. Yeah. I mean, CPAG in their submission, I know we don't have the Child Poverty Action Group with us um, this morning, but they've given a couple of sort of quite concerning examples, you know, a, long, a lone parent suffering from stress and depression, her baby's been admitted to hospital for failure to thrive, uh, they're at risk of eviction, and the client would like payments to be made to her rent arrears by direct deduction from her universal credit. Um, but she's not able to engage with the DWP because of everything that's going on in her life, and the solicitor trying to avert the eviction has been unable to converse with DWP on her behalf as they won't accept implicit consent. I mean, that, that, that's just one of a, a couple of examples they've given, which are hugely concerning. I mean, what can we do as a committee to try and prevent this kind of unnecessary suffering? I think it's taken recommendations and somebody monitoring that and whether or not DWP has actually applied and reviewed and, and listened to what DWP, sorry, to what the ICO has said, because as you'll see from the ICO, the they're monitoring it, but they're not expecting a formal response to come back from DWP to say, you know, in terms of an audit, when we have an audit, we have to respond to that audit. DWP don't have to do that in this case. So I think if the committee could somehow track and keep checking and liaising with the ICO, I think that would be very helpful. So we need to be recording the instances where, the, where this is having that impact and acting on them. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's all from me, convener. Okay. Um, can I just check with uh, fellow committee members? I don't actually see any other bids for, for, for questions. We still have a little bit of time in hand. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and, I was waiting because obviously... And, 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 and I know you've you, 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 been late this morning. It was unavoidable, but yeah. it's, it's good to see you here. Thank um, you. Yeah. And, and apologies, my Ines, I had a, an issue I had to deal with. Um, thank you very much for, for your evidence so far. Um, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things for my own understanding. Um, you talked about, I think, Mr Bailey, you talked about the fact that previously you would just get somebody to sign a mandate, and I think, Ms Stewart, you referred to the same thing, and that was easy. My understanding is that, that consent can still be given in writing, so in effect the same process can still be used. So I just wondered whether you are doing that, whether you have done that, and what is the kind of fundamental difference? Because, Mr. Bailey, you refer to the fact that you would just get somebody to sign it and you'd send it off, and you know it could take a couple of weeks to get lost in Wolverhampton. But presumably, <coughs> you can still get somebody to sign it. You can still send it off. Uh, have you been doing that? And if so, has it worked? Can, sorry. No. can I say? Um, you can still get someone to, to type in a, an, an online journal that they give um, explicit consent for you to act on their behalf. But as I said before, we have clients who can't use technology, so they don't have online journals. These are telephone no, claims. I mean, can you write in no. as opposed to digitally? You can write You've in. You've not been able to do that, I'm afraid. No? No. Because? Because it's not been accepted. It's, uh, have you tried doing it? We have tried doing it, and we've, we've, but we haven't been successful with it. We haven't got okay. lots of cases, but um, often mandates now aren't successful anyway. Um, mm. They don't always, you know, uh, although that a, a client has said that they give you authority to act on their behalf, DWP often just don't recognise that anyway at the moment. Um, because, but they were given implicit consent, so that's fine. So how many, how many cases, roughly, has it been the mandate been refused? Well, as I'm saying, we don't have a lot of cases that you see at the moment because of the type of client group that we work with. 
Um, but and I actually only know one case that's been refused so far. So, but I'm, I, so I'm when you say often, you, well, you mean one? Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, yeah, uh, we'll have heard one. Yeah. Okay. And Mr. Bailey? I think that they should accept mm -hmm. it in writing, but yes, there are still those understand. structural issues, i.e. the length of time of the mandate, and obviously the mandate would have to be adjusted to say, well, look, we're, we're dealing with this particular issue and obviously uh, uh, nothing else. And again, as, as has been explained earlier, um, that issues can roll on for many months and they can also involve m multiple problems, um, not just the original query that the person comes in with. It can be a bit like, you know, uh, peeling an onion. There are many layers to it. So that would be, yes, you can still do it in writing. Uh, we still seek a mandate, uh, and which can and has been submitted. I haven't come across any examples of it being refused, uh, but it's still bound by li the limitations on explicit consent, whether it's done on the journal, whether it's done in writing, or whether it's done over the telephone. So the real issue is around having to renew it in order to deal with an ongoing... Yeah complaint mm -hmm. and then you said also about the time lag mm -hmm. um, in terms of when you do it in writing the time lag to get that has that has that got worse than than for legacy benefits then or is it similar or, or what's what's the scenario I, there I, I couldn't I couldn't particularly comment in terms of comparing with uh, legacy benefits to, to to universal credit but as I said as much as I would be a, continually advocating for implicit consent, as I think all of us would. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't a perfect system, um, and maybe something can be put together that would be a combination of, of both in terms of the ease of submitting uh, consent, but also having that, uh, you know, g given it implicitly. Um, sorry, I've lost the train of thought there, actually, sorry. Um, that will pass. Okay. Our experience of explicit consent is that it's quite time limited as well, often just to 24 hours. Um, yeah, the, the, I mean, we've been told that, that it'll only last for 24 hours. And, and I don't know if that's to do with the fact that they're, they're phone claims or what, that they're not, they're not typed down. Um, but we have had that experience as well. Okay. Is that anybody else's experience? Certainly not our experience. Um, but as I say, certainly in Highland, we have been working with Universal Credit for a number of years now, so our teams are very practised in terms of the consent. Um, we advise our clients exactly what to say, because we now know what to say to ensure that that, ex that um, consent is valid for the period. Um, but then quite often the case goes, takes another direction, and that's when the consent doesn't cover that part. So a deduction's taken off, for example, that you weren't aware of when you... you set the, con the consent with the claimant um, so that's where the challenge comes in for us but we've not experienced a 24 hour expiry date um, not for you either we've not experienced anything about 24 hours not sure mm -hmm. why you've been given that yeah that, that does yeah. seem a bit weird yeah, yeah. But, but i think that's down to it as well it's a new mm. system in edinburgh and we are getting mixed messages about um what you can and can't do that's fine um and I forgot my other one. Can I come back if I remember what it was? And I I will fill the bus for thirty seconds. You can come back in, Michelle. We've got a bit of time in hand. I, I think I think Michelle's line of questioning was really interesting in, in two fronts. One is that a lot of the data is not captured on this. So let Sandra Stewart's reply about with a small but incredibly vulnerable cohort. You've got one specific example, but you've heard anecdotally from other agencies that it's happening elsewhere, but there's no number crunching in relation to exactly how much, because I suppose you're too busy helping vulnerable people rather than bean count how many times uh, that this is all happening. Plus, earlier in the session, we heard about actually some really good examples of practice in the DWP, but an inconsistency. Um, uh, across the country in, in, in relation to it. And that just gives, I think, some context. I was actually filibustering for you, Michelle Ballantyne, yeah, because but and I, and I, and I, <laughs> I know you, you missed that earlier exchange, so that, that kind of fills in a wee bit on that, Michelle. Yeah. Old brain, you see, it gets fuzzy. Um, yeah, I just wanted to come back to something that you were talking about, Sheila, when you were talking about um, implementing Skype as a support mechanism. Um, and I was rather fascinated by that because obviously that's a digital solution to a digital problem um so I, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about that because if it if um you know you were talking about the rurality issues and the fact that people couldn't access face-to-face -face support but equally had a real problem with their digital support so how is the implementation of a digital solution to that digital problem being done to overcome that that 
you know, digital yes, lack of capability. We worked very closely um, with the national DWP team um, on introducing Skype. And what we did was we deliberately chose the offices we chose. We have got two sites in Highland. We've got one in Kinloch Burvey, which is extremely rural, um, but is in the Citizens Advice Bureau. The other facility is in our local authority one-stop shop, what we call a service point. In both instances, there are advisors, welfare advisors, to support, and claimants need support on each and every time they access that. So the digital solution is with support. So it's with specialist support. If you were to put it into a booth somewhere on the middle of high, in the middle of the Princess Street without that support, I'm not sure it would be so successful. Um, so there is a cost to administering this from a local authority and citizen advice perspective. And what, what happened with these vulnerable clients previously? How did they get that direct support previously? Is it just a question of needing multiple contact support or, or is there something different going on in that first sort of set? sort of support because what it has done the, the one in a, the one-stop shop um in uh, Golsby mm -hmm. so Golsby the closest job center is 50 miles away so it's a 100 mile trip and public transport links means you may not get there and back in a day um what we were doing previously was my team were going out to people's homes and supporting them in their homes so that has reduced in that particular locality mm -hmm. in terms of Golsby itself but of course, Sutherland is the largest geographical area in Highland, and we're servicing the rest of Sutherland by going into people's homes. So it's complementing existing services. It hasn't eradicated um, existing services. People in Gosby now can come to a point rather than you going out to them. So, um, yes. OK, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, are there any other questions from members? Um, I think that the little bit of time we've got in hand will be uh, moving on to the next agenda item shortly, if there's anything any of our witnesses today feel that look, there's a line of questioning that you just expected and it hasn't happened and therefore you have not had the opportunity to put on the official report something you really wanted to convey today, you've got an opportunity to, to, to do that now. You don't, don't feel that you have to, but the opportunity is there. Oh, Sheila's coming straight away for, <laughs> for for a bid to do that. So, so why don't you make the comments that, that you would like to make, uh, Sheila, and that gives others opportunity to consider whether there's something they want to put on the record as well before we close this particular session. Sheila McCandy. Thank you very much, convener. Um, explicit consent. When DWP have been challenged over explicit consent, Neil Cooling has been very consistent in his response. And what he has said is... Under legacy benefits, they collected a set of personal data. Under universal credit, they are collecting more personal data. I don't understand what that additional personal data is. And I think it would be very helpful for the committee and for ourselves as practitioners to understand, well, what is that additional um, data that has been collected that requires us to shift to such an extreme position where we've got explicit consent? Because perhaps if we all understood it, we could work with DWP to overcome some of the barriers that are presenting itself. I just don't understand what the additional data is, because what we've done is we've fed, as, as the committee know very well, we have fed a number of benefits into universal credit, so we were already collecting all of that data, and we were operating under implicit consent. I don't understand why we've had to have the shift to explicit consent, because Mr Cooling hasn't been very explicit in terms of explaining that to us. OK, thank you. Um, you, you, you can do it. It is very quick. Only, only because of time constraints, Michelle, but very brief. Very yeah. quick. Did you have implicit consent to deal with HMRC? Was, was that the same access? Do working tax credits, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. It was quick. It was very quick. Yes. Uh, okay. We'll go. Okay. Let, let's go from my right to left then, which 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 we will we'll take we'll take you then, Sandra. So you get the final word in relation to the evidence session. Uh, Richard Bailey. Yes. I mean, I think just just following up, and that's a really important point that, that Sheila's made. I mean, the, the DWP have already made it clear about the information that they won't disclose. They won't disclose your address, your date of birth, your national insurance number, your bank details, your sort code, your telephone number, uh, names of your household members. I could go on. So, yeah, if that is clear from the outset, I do not see why they can't use implicit consent. Um, I mean, if improvements, I want to say very much I'm going to be saying that, that, that I think we would all agree that we want implicit consent for universal credit and if that's your intervention, and that's a 
message. I'm glad about that. Yeah. If there were to be improvements, and I think that was one of your questions to explicit consent, it would be, and I take Richard's point as well, actually, because when people do come to, to, to see us, uh, they don't want to spend time with us. So the type of consent that the person actually wants is to help me with my benefits from now and this day forward uh, for all issues. And that's the type of consent that people want. And if we want to restore agency to people, I would say that, that that's what we should be doing. But nonetheless, I would say I would agree. Where are these data breaches? I think explicit consent, again, it's the DWP deciding what's right and wrong for, for, for claimants and not them. And I think I would, I, would, I would finally say that in terms of explicit consent, it would appear to support claimants in the way that a barbed wire chair would support your back. Okay, thank you. Uh, Richard Gass. Yep, uh, final point on uh, the Apollo list, which is a list of staff who have a right to access certain information without client consent for the purposes of that's laid down in legislation for things like administration of housing benefit for entitled uh, uh, working out eligibility for uh, Scottish Welfare Fund uh, to ensure they've got the right charge for a residential or non-residential care charge. Our staff have found a degree of difficulty using the Apollo list to gain information about universal credit, being advised that no, you can't do it, the client would need to put information on the journal. Now we do, within the council, have access to CIS, the client index system for DWP, and again, it's for very strict purposes, but there seems to be, within, within universal credit, just a, a misunderstanding about what information can be shared and when, and don't know if that's driven just from the the fear that was raised earlier on that it's how do they process the amount of work they've got to process and that they're pushing things off their table. Okay, thank you. And uh, Sandra, I did promise to give you the last word, so let me just put one thing on the record so you actually do get the last word. Um, um, I've just uh, received a reply from the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions in relation to protected data claim. I can't really speak on behalf of the committee because they've not seen it yet. I would personally describe it as woefully inadequate, but I'll make sure that that uh, correspondence put on the on 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 our website uh, as early as possible, so that uh, others others can see that correspondence that we've received. So I've now put that on the record. So you do have the last word now, Sandra Short. Uh, just to agree with my colleagues on the panel that um, not having implicit consent is just creating more barriers for our clients and making our job much more difficult. Okay, and then on that note, um, we, we will leave it. I did say that that would be the last word. Um, can I thank all, all, all four witnesses for, for your, uh, your your support today in relation to, to, to this evidence session? Um, as always in these situations, if you're on the way back to Glasgow or Edinburgh or up to the Highlands, you go, I should have raised that point. This doesn't end with consideration of these matters. We'll be taking a consideration of the evidence we've heard uh, in private uh, late, later later this morning. But if there's anything else you want to, want, want to draw to our attention, please, please do that through, through the Clark and team. And we very much appreciate uh, you coming along this morning. Thank you very much. So that ends that particular evidence session. And we now move to agenda item three. Uh, actually, I said we should suspend briefly until, until witnesses leave. So we'll just do that. Let, let's suspend briefly before we move to agenda item three.
subordinate legislation and can refer members uh, to paper three note by the clerk. The committee is invited to consider the Welfare Foods Best Start Food Scotland Regulations 2019 SSI number 193 forward slash 2019 which are subject to the negative procedure. The DPLR committee considered the regulations at its meeting on the 18th of June. It has drawn these regulations to the attention of the Parliament on the grounds that the meaning of Regulation 18 could be clearer. It requires more clarity. Um, the Scottish Government has undertaken to bring forward an instrument shortly to rectify this issue and this has been welcomed by the DPLR committee. Um, as the Scottish Government is att attending to this matter that the, the, uh, uh, our sister committee has raised, um, before I say is the committee content just to note the instrument, which is the question I'm going to ask, are there any comments that members may wish to make in, in the first instance. Uh, I, I know Mr Griffin had a comment. I'll take Mr Griffin and I'll take Mr Brown. Thanks, Camina. I, I mean, I think there's a lot um, of good things in um, this instrument, particularly the, the increase of the funding from £3.10 a week to £4.25 a week. Um, the no recovery of unintentional overpayments is something I think um, should be warmly welcomed as well, as well as um, the transitional protection um, with the eligibility reducing from um, four years old to three year old is welcome too. But then that brings me on to some of the, the concerns that I have. I think um, I would like to hear from the government more about why um, they felt the, the eligibility should reduce from four um, to three, um, while they still have have been able to fund that transitional protection. I think that raises the question as to why that um, the funding couldn't be provided on an ongoing basis to maintain that level of eligibility to, to four-year-olds. And on a, a process um, question, um, the legislative route for um, this instrument is through the Social Security Act 1988 and not the Social Security Scotland Act. 2018, which means um, it's not covered by some of the things this committee worked very hard to, to put in in place, and in, um, I'm particular um, thinking about the, the Scottish government's take-up strategy to ensure um, maximum um, uptake. Um, my my final point was just on another thing the, the committee have been working hard on, and that is on um, automation. Um, I'm, I would like some clarification from um, the government as well as to why um, people who will be moving on to this new system will be invited to apply rather than um, automatically transferring, which is, I know, something that's been close to the heart of um, a lot of committee members. But thanks for the opportunity to put some of those um, queries on the on the record. No, no, thank you for putting that on the record. I would take Mr Brown... Uh, then Ms Johnson a second. I, I should also put on the record, it's absolutely valid that you, you do that, Mark, but I should also put on the record that the SSI was circulated to members uh, two weeks ago and if there was any detailed issues in relation to this particular SSI, we, we were asked that if, if they could be raised in advance to allow us to do maybe something more meaningful in, in relation to, to, to some of those points. And obviously um, no one got back in, in, in relation to that. But rather than skirt around some of the points that's been made, I, I wonder, when I'm just looking at members there, in relation to take up an automa automation, we're already in correspondence with the government and looking at potential uh, uh, lines of work for this committee in relation to that, so hopefully uh, we'll, we'll be dealing with that in, in due course uh, as a committee. Um, and also, uh, there was another point you, you raised, yes, a budgetary and, and a, a, who, who, who would, the criteria for qualifying for, for the monies. And we will, of course, be looking at budget scrutiny uh, as a committee as well, and that might be an opportunity to return to some of that. So I'm just trying to be helpful in where we could, as a committee, move forward in relation to some of the, the, the issues that, that you raised, Mark, but you've put them on the record, which is absolutely your right and the right thing to do, because uh, you felt strongly about it. Keith Brown? Uh, yeah, and thanks, Kevin. And just from my own point of view, the points that uh, have been raised by Mark Griffin, I'm happy for if it was to be a case of writing to the government to ask about these things, I wouldn't be in favour of delaying going ahead with this. I'm happy to note that. I just My concern is about the... Uh, 
par paragraph six, I think it is, where it said that the commencement date, the reason for this having to be agreed now is because the commencement date is the 12th of August, and for that reason, it's not possible to lay the instrument 40 days before. I don't think that is a reason. I, I think they work out what the commencement date is, and they should work back from that to do it 40 days in advance. That's not a reason. There might be a reason, and I think my own view is we should ask them what the reason is, not just stating this. But I don't think that's sufficient for us not to, in my view anyway, agree even the questions which Mark has raised for us to go forward. I think it's important it does. Okay. Um, make a couple of suggestions in a second, but we'll, let's wrap up all the various comments we've got because a number of members want, want to make comments now. Alison Johnson. Um, thank you. Um, I, I too am content that it go ahead, um, but just on, on the record, I'd like to um, raise the issue that the Child Poverty Action Group do with regards to prepayment cards and, uh, you know, the stigma that this can have um, and that we should always be looking towards a cash payment wherever possible because a lot of smaller shops, particularly in poorer communities in rural areas, don't don't accept um, such cards. I'd also, I, I just think sort of as a matter of course when we're dealing with issues like this, it would be helpful if the Scottish Government could advise what their position is on uprating and uprating in line with the cost of food, um, which does change. Um, and also, you know, what provision there are for, for those who do not, um, you, you know, who, who for whatever reason, allergies or otherwise, are, are you know, unable to have cow's milk or uh, formula or eggs, you know, what the alternatives might be. I just think those are things that could be included as a matter of course. Okay, thank you. Jeremy Balfour? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mina. I mean, I think, I, I'm, I think with Mark, uh, sorry, with Alison and Keith, I don't think we should delay this. But I do think we should write to the government with Mark's questions, asking for clarification on them. I also think we do want to probably just put down as a mark as a committee now. I agree with Keith. I think we don't want to get to a stage that things are coming to us absolutely last minute and we're having to chase our tails to do this. And, and I do think we need to say to the government that we do need to see these as early as possible. And I, I take your point that they, we were asked to look at them two weeks ago and we're circling to be sure, but this is the first time that we've had a public session on it to be able to raise these. And so I do think going forward with regulations that will follow <clears throat> in the autumn and next year, we need to give ourselves time as a committee to be able to reflect on them and call in the appropriate witnesses if required. So I think we should put that in a letter along with March questions to the government, but I'm content not to delay this because I think it is... <clears throat> But there are more positives than negatives. And I'll make a suggestion around what you've said at the end, Mr Balfour, that's very helpful. Michelle? Yes, I, th I think I'm probably going to echo a lot of what's been said already because it is a negative instrument. instrument. I, I could not see when, when it was sent out to us two weeks ago. I didn't see us objecting to it as such. But that doesn't mean there aren't some concerns around the timing of it and certainly around some of the, the points in it that I would like to understand or have some clarification as we go forward. Um, and I did want to hear what other members thought about it as well, so that we could have a consolidated kind of question list. Um, one that hasn't been mentioned that I did have a concern about, and that's with the removal of four-year-olds um, on the assumption that they will all be in early years care um, and therefore will get their lunch in early years care. Um, Talking to people, my sense is that not all of them will be for various reasons um, and I am concerned therefore that some will lose out as a result of this and I would like um, some some clarification from the government on the evidence base they use to to make the assumption that the removal of four years four year olds wouldn't have any detriment to vulnerable families. Okay, are there any other comments before I, I make a suggestion? Okay, there have been no other comments. Uh, I think it might be helpful to talk about um, why I mentioned the, the, the two weeks previous about members being aware of this. It wasn't to uh, not have this detail put on the record this morning, but it might, and it's not a requirement, it might have afforded Clark's the opportunity to have a structured approach by the committee ready for this morning uh, to, to help support our discussions. That, 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 that would be the only reason for that. Now, I have captured, and I want to just make sure I've got this right, I think three central points from what I've heard. We've heard about the uprating going forward. Um, with that, that came out quite clearly. We've heard about the qualifying criteria and how it was arrived at, and in particular around... Uh, the four-year-olds issue, we've, we've heard about that, and we've heard issues more generally around the, the uptake. Now, that said, I think everyone is actually, whether 
explicitly or implicitly, given our last evidence session, I think we're welcoming this from what I can see, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't still scrutinise uh, the, the, the details of it. So if members are content, I would be keen um, uh, to write to the Minister in relation to upbraiding, in relation to qualifying criteria, and particularly mention issues around four-year-olds, uh, and in relation to uptake more generally, but also to indicate that's a matter more widely we're looking to look at as a committee anyway. Um, would would members be content that I write to the minister on 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 on, 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 on the forty days as well? But the DPLR, I think, is dealing with that that matter also. Um, I would imagine. I just I'm trying not not to duplicate. We can mention the forty days. I'm just trying to be focused on what we write about. So let's mention the forty days as well. Okay. Um, I, I'm keen. If people are content with that, I'm keen not to open up a wider debate, but I don't want to curtail it either. So let's take these comments briefly, because we've still got to actually just finalise what we're doing. We've got one more agenda item as well. Yes. Keith Brown and then <coughs> Mark Griffin. Very briefly, I'm, I'm content with that. Content with that the point I'm making is not about the fact that it's late. Obviously, that's... But it might be completely uh, unavoidable. It's just that there's not a reason given for it. So I'm just looking to try and get the reason for it. That's just to uh, clarify that. I'm fine with what you propose. Yes, absolutely. We'll check what DPLR committee are doing in relation to, to, to that as well. Um, Mark. Uh, and just briefly, can you give me enough? We could just ask um, the question as to why the it's, it's been brought forward through the Social Security Act 1988 and not the the one that we passed recently. Okay, happy happy to do that. I think the discussion is helpful because when we go away from this meeting, then we have to draft a letter that's reflective of of the mood of the committee. So that does actually that does actually help. That said. Uh, we, we welcome the fact that we're, we're looking at what is hopefully progress being made by the Scottish Government, but we still have to scrutinise it uh, robustly. Um, so the question I said we were going to ask is that is the committee content to simply, with the caveats mentioned, simply to note the instrument? Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, as previously agreed, we now move to agenda item four. Universal Credit Consent Provisions, which we've agreed to take in private. So we're now moving to private session.